offers reliable dealers, fair prices, and the largest variety of any Iowa show. You'll find every type of quality antique, plus advice you can count on from the country's top dealers. Don't miss it. The Cedar Rapids Antique Show and Collector's Fair, this Friday through Sunday at the Five Seasons Center. The New Tech Times, a video magazine for the electronic age. In this edition, home video dishes and scrambled signals. The controversy heats up over who owns the airwaves. Also, a look at QTV, an experiment in two-way television that's been put on hold. Later, a museum for robots and a review of Apple's new Macintosh. All this and more in this edition of the New Tech Times. The New Tech Times is brought to you through a grant from Warsaw Insurance Companies. Times change. Wausau works. And by the collective voice of the consumer electronics industry. CEG, the Consumer Electronics Group, Electronic Industries Association. Nicholas Johnson. Every week, this video magazine of ours, the New Tech Times, travels over 46,000 miles to get to your TV set. Well, that's a fancy way of saying your local public broadcasting station receives it in a dish-shaped antenna from a satellite. Communication satellites have been used by television networks and cable television systems for some time. What's relatively new about satellite receiving dishes is that what was once a $300,000 industrial item has now become a $3,000 addition to the home TV set. And with it, you can get more than 80 channels and some legal headaches. Here's our report. This odd-looking hardware is called a parabolic antenna, or home earth station. If you see it in your neighbor's backyard, you can be sure that they're tuned into what was once the exclusive province of networks and cable companies. Mm -hmm. The dish permits the home consumer to focus it on any satellite and pick up freely a wide variety of TV programming. Cable companies, naturally, aren't happy about what they see as an invasion of their artistic license. The fact that the uh, dishes are now more commonly available, and that is largely the result of uh, improvements in manufacturing and price reductions and competition, gives us a problem in that they're more widely available and there are people that are going out and buying these antennas and putting them in their backyard and, and actually engaging in what I'll call satellite scanning. Um, they're, they're pointing their air stations in the sky and, and looking at a variety of communication satellites and picking up whatever programming happens to be there. Of course, HBO is there. Shenango County, New York is a predominantly rural area where cable access is minimal. For this community, the home dish is vital in obtaining clear reception and good programming. People have requested cable to come to their house for years, and they're told, unless you have 30 people, we can't do it. And there are something like probably five people per mile now, and I doubt that will change because it's all farms. We're so remote, and local TV coverage is not... Uh, that good that we rely on the satellites for good quality and quantity of pictures. Well, I don't think the people in the country should be deprived of having television the same as somebody in a town or a village. Uh, I think they're entitled to the same thing. And they're willing to pay for it. It's not that people aren't want to get something for nothing. Because it has been stated that as the satellite uh, field has been deregulated, we feel that the airspaces are free and that we're entitled to receive whatever, whatever is being sent down to Earth. In the midst of this dilemma of the dish, Home Box Office is making use of a counter technology to defend its airwaves. The only people that are authorized to receive HBO are cable television systems. Mm -hmm. And so by scrambling our signal, anyone who has a private air station will not be able to receive HBO. HBO's scrambled signal looks like this. What it boils down to, as far as what we're concerned, is who owns the airwaves and um, I think that what they will do is they will end up scrambling. And I, I keep saying discrimination, and I mean this emphatically, that uh, what's going to happen is that they will scramble the signals, and anyone who owns the system now will have to buy a descrambler, an extra cost to them, which, you know, it, it, I'm sure that it will be expensive. 
What HBO would like from rebellious dish owners is to have them interact with local cable dealers and the HBO decoder. People will eventually be authorized to receive our programming through their dishes. They will have to locate, they'll have to install a decoder in their, um, somewhere in their home. And that decoder can be individually addressed, turned on and turned off based on whether they pay their bill or not. This could prove to be just the beginning of a long and protracted struggle between the cable companies and dish owners as home antennas continue to scan the satellites. If you love television, can't get cable, and have that $3,000, satellite reception can be fun. But you may be buying problems as well as programming. Another technology facing serious problems today is cable television. Complaints are mounting all across the country about shoddy installations, rate hikes, and broken promises. The story is told that Governor Long of Louisiana was repeatedly visited by a group of irate constituents that he promised everything from hospitals to bridges. When he refused to see them, an aide pleaded, I have to tell them something. The governor looked up and said, just tell them I lied. Some folks today are charging cable companies with similar tactics. Wherever the blame may properly lie, there are a number of disappointed cities these days with cable woes. Here's Gary Probst's report. So I'm going to test our viewers right now and find out if they know which items have the most sodium if we show you three different items. We'd like you to touch now and let us know which of those three items, one, two, or three, contain the most sodium. This is an example of something new in television. It's a program with interaction between the viewers and people hosting the show. The folks at home can answer questions with the push of a button on their cable TV remote control. A computer records the electronic impulse and tells the host what viewers think. What you have is two-way TV. Please let us know and touch now. Interactive television is an experiment of Warner Amex Cable through a system called Cube. It started almost eight years ago in Columbus, Ohio. The shows had reasonable success. So in 1983, the people at Warner decided to set up a national interactive network serving cable subscribers in six major cities. Cindy Reinhardt and John Petrie worked on a network show called Soap Scoop. But now, they're unemployed. Financial problems forced Warner to dump most of the network's programming just a few months after its inception. A grand idea planned for millions of consumers had been put on hold. People were an actual part of the show. Uh, we even did it about Soap Scoop and our format. Um, what do you like best about it? Um, you like the interviews? Do you like our... Uh, going to New York, uh, do you like telephone interviews, what do you like best, and boy did they jump on that. Uh, they want to tell you, people want to be a part of what you're doing anymore. That's why I think, if I may say so, Phil Donahue was so popular, because he went to, the, he went to the audience, you know, and I got to go to the audience, and the audience got to come to me, and was no longer a talking head. Cindy hosted the program and claims to have had up to 60,000 viewers talking electronically about soap operas. But people at Warner Amex say they could not find enough advertising support for network programming. Interactive was not catching on the way they had expected. Frankly, I think we all thought that with all the promises that were made by franchising, by ourselves and by every other company, that the interactive as we know of it would proliferate more within the industry. I happen to believe it still will. We just can't say when. We're still ahead. We're years ahead of anybody else. John Petrie used to be vice president in charge of the Cube Network. He says Warner Amex made a mistake when the company deflated its efforts towards two-way TV. But I don't think it has to do with the, whether the people want it or don't want it. Um, I think if it's there, they'll use it. Um, but it's up to the individual companies, do they want to... It is an expensive system to build and to maintain. There is no two ways about that. It's a question of whether the companies want to go into it for the long-range profit of it. And once, once the sub subscriber base is up, then it will be an extremely profitable business. It's just a few years away from that now. But a lack of profit is the reason Petrie and other Cube Network employees were laid off. Other subsidiaries of Warner Amex suffered multi-million dollar losses in 1983. Cube was a pioneering effort, something to produce profits in the future. So it was a candidate for short-term budget cuts. 
the concept remains viable, the technology remains viable, and we will just inch back into, um, hopefully, some regular programming on the CUBE network. Cube used to supply 90 minutes of live television a day. Now there are just a few national specials, like this show and the movie The Day After. Just simply a question of tabulating the results, and we'll take a look and see whether people, in fact, do have hope. One subscriber with a keen interest in Cube is Keith Tyler. He's been observing from his vantage point as chairman of the Columbus Cable TV Commission. Tyler believes Interactive has a future, but most people still aren't ready for it. I have an old saying that just because science makes something possible does not mean that people will utilize it to a full extent. Tyler rarely used his interactive capabilities. Most of the shows were of no interest to him. This is not exactly my preferred <laughs> viewing, but it's all right. They played games and tried to devise and experiment with many other ways of using the interactive feature but uh, we didn't participate in much of that. I, I'm sorry, but we're busy people. <laughs> That's one big reason interactive TV is slow to grow. The technology is fascinating, but most people prefer to watch movies without talking back. If you have story ideas or comments, send them to the New Tech Times, 821 University Avenue, Madison, Wisconsin, 53706 or just call the source or CompuServe. When I was an FCC commissioner, the broadcasting industry kept telling us that cable television would cause commercial television to collapse. Cable operators were stealing their programs. Family values would crumble. Some might now say they were right. But most broadcasters look back on those wild charges with embarrassment. Yet the fact remains that the new technology has had a major impact on conventional television. In the early days of broadcasting, stations banded together to protect their interests. Today, their trade association is called the National Association of Broadcasters. Its president, Eddie Fritz, is a longtime Mississippi radio broadcaster. He's with us now by satellite from Washington. Mr. Fritz, welcome to the New Tech Times. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Glad to be with you. Uh, tell us a little something about the NAB. What is this organization? Well, the National Association of Broadcasters represents 4,500 radio stations. 700 uh, plus television stations and all of the commercial networks as the lobbying arm for the industry here in Washington representing uh, the broadcast industry before Congress, before the FCC, and before the other regulatory agencies which impact on broadcasting. Uh, what are some of the issues that you're now confronting in Washington? What are the broadcasters concerned about? Broadcasters are concerned about a number of issues in, bro in, in, in the city right now. Currently we're involved in over 150 issues through our legal and our government relations departments. Uh, some of those that are more or less the front burner issues, obviously, are deregulation, uh, quite frankly, the elimination of paperwork and uh, comparative renewals from the licensing process of radio and television stations, which uh, has passed uh, the Senate and uh, has some 230 co-sponsors in the House of Representatives and is um, uh, being considered by the House Telecommunications Subcommittee at this time. One of the things that seems to be happening now is that the conventional broadcaster, the over-the-air network-affiliated VHF television station, is garnering less and less of the audience. Those percentages were up in the 90 percent uh, when, obviously, we had nothing very much but uh, network affiliates. Uh, now I think they have about 78 percent of the audience. Uh, one major advertising agency is uh, projecting this is going to fall to 65 percent by 1990. Uh, does that concern you all? Well, certainly it concerns, uh, it concerns us, and I think there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, the marketplace in television today is being fragmented with um, uh, the influx of cable as it grows to serving nearly 40% of the country. It offers a wider diversity of, of programming to, to the American public. Uh, also, we have uh, some 200-plus independent stations which have come on the air, which offer a variety of programming. So the the general public certainly has a wider choice, and we think, uh, considering that choice, that uh, the broadcasting over-the-air industry is um, uh, holding up quite well. We, we noticed that in this year, uh, toward the end of 1983, those numbers began to trend back upward rather than downward. What are some of these other technologies that the broadcasters are confronting now as competition? 
Well, I think that uh, uh, there are a number of them. Multi-channel distribution service, or MDS, uh, direct broadcast satellite, which would offer programming uh, direct from satellite uh, to the home via rooftop antennas, um, will be on the air. In fact, it's on the air in the Midwest now, and uh, I think in the Indiana area, and uh, is being offered uh, shortly uh, nationwide. Satellite uh, master antenna systems, which basically uh, is, a, is a condominium or an apartment type uh, cable system, and um, uh, multi-channel TV, which is uh, an expanded form of MDS, certainly is something that's going to, to offer more competition, not only to the over-the-air television stations, but also to the local cable systems. Now, you think this is good for the consumer? Is this an example of marketplace forces and deregulation? Is this something the broadcasters now welcome? When I was on the FCC, broadcasters were really fighting the cable business. Well, I think from a public perspective, I think the public will have a wider choice of programming uh, from which to make their selections. And clearly, uh, we would like for broadcasters to be able to compete on an even playing field with these other technologies, which, by the way, are not regulated. Uh, they have no public interest standard, and uh, broadcasters uh, over the air free broadcasting uh, will still be the backbone of, of our commercial system of broadcasting, uh, not, only, not only today, but also in the foreseeable future. And what do you see in the future? I think you'll be watching your local stations. Um, local broadcasters are the reflection of their communities, and local broadcasters will continue to provide uh, good, strong, solid local news, local information, local public affairs, something that the people will tune in for and will listen. And ultimately, that's the backbone of the system which, is, which has been so successful, and that's the system that we now have in America. Clearly, there'll be fragmentation because of the new technologies, but that'll be more in a specialized area. I think uh, broadcasting as we know it today in year 2000 will certainly be strong, viable, and healthy. Well, Mr. Fritz, with, uh, with that uh, a happy look forward, I want to thank you uh, very much for uh, uh, coming to visit with us here on the New Tech Times. Mr. Johnson, it's our pleasure. Thank you very much. One form of new electronics technology broadcasters don't have to worry about, at least not yet, is the robot. We've had prior segments on the robot's impact on the workplace and early introduction into the home, robots like Hero One and Topo. Few electronic gadgets have more enthusiastic boosters. Even if you and I have not yet understood what it is these walking, talking computers are actually going to do for us, but they've already come far enough to warrant their own exhibit at the American Craft Museum in New York City. Here's our report, produced by NRA Jones. Here come the robots to the American Craft Museum in New York. This is the robot exhibit, history, fantasy, and reality. The first major museum exhibition in the United States devoted to tracing the robot's place in our past. This little fellow greeted visitors who'd lined up around the block to see the show. T.O.T. may be built like a talking ice cooler, but he just isn't all digit speak. He can walk, tell time, sense his way around other objects, and do light housekeeping. Oh, he's operating that, I see, by remote control, see? Right? Not even attached to anything. There are over 160 robots in the show, and they run the gamut from the plain industrial robotics arm to creatures of a more fanciful nature. It's possible to meet something shaped like a garbage can that will sing you to sleep, or an updated version of the Tin Man with disco music in his navel. The show aims to place the robot in our collective imagination by displaying a wide variety of automatons, drawings, books, and toys. The exhibition is the brainchild of guest curator and robot historian Robert Malone. Robots want to, want to relate to you, they want to talk to you, they want to be moved, and the fact that movement is fascinating to people. It's kind of a magic, it's kind of a magic in robots. What do you like about this one? Mm, because it's smiling, and then you can grab things, and it has these buttons. The Crafts Museum is rating the show as one of the most well-attended in its history, and by far the majority of viewers are children. 
Malone specially designed many of the displays for hands-on experience. Do touch was the order of the day, and kids and robots blended together in an old traditional fascination. They want to understand it, and that's the difference between possibly an adult and a child's relationship, is the child is in his own naivete accepting the technology. The child, I think, wants the technology. They say, this is mine. I think they see them as, as dolls with, with some sort of amusing intelligence, which they don't altogether understand. They want to take charge, and they're going to be the ones that design the integrated aesthetics of these robots, to program these robots, to invent these robots. So you feel that these kids are very aware of all this. The whole idea of a rolling, talking, commuting world, I don't think bothers them at all. I think they, they will grow up with it and accept it the same way that we accept cars flying around the streets. They will accept robots on the sidewalk. Well, one said everybody was crowding around him, and they said, um, please move back, I, I have to breathe. Despite the odd assortment of mechanized mannequins, maybe what we're seeing here is a softer side of technology. Or is it just the usual magic of a child's imagination that turns piles of microboards and painted metal into a heroic friend? The computer, computerized robot can instruct a child with patience that you wouldn't believe. An adult patience wears out. It can, face, it can be face-to-face. -face. It's their robot. They are in charge. They are teaching themselves by being in charge. So that it's a self-instructive sort of thing. They begin to program the robot, so the robot is doing what they want it to do. And the robot, in turn, says, well, now that you've taught me this, how do you spell it? Or whatever it wants to say. It can begin to challenge the child, but in the child's own terms, not authoritatively. Soon the robots may be coming to your town, as the museum plans to travel the show throughout the country for the next two and a half years. You may remember baseball player Satchel Paige's advice, don't look back, there may be something gaining on you. Well, you can be sure we'll be looking back at robots from time to time, and if it looks like they're gaining on us, I'll let you know. Actually, it was quite by accident that I was one of the first to know about a new computer called the Macintosh. I'd wandered into an Iowa City computer store looking for a shirt pocket computer, which they didn't have, only to find them uncrating the first Macintosh. I was so enthralled with a new program called McPaint that I spent the whole afternoon playing with it. Meanwhile, Tim Anosco was doing the same thing here in Madison, but his play turned into this review. Well, here's the Macintosh, the computer that Apple is betting hundreds of thousands of you will want to use. Maybe a little bit difficult to tell on television, but the Mac is slightly over a foot tall and weighs about 20 pounds. It may look like a toy, but it isn't. In computer slang, this thing has horsepower and headroom. That is, lots of speed and memory. Take some solid shapes. Here, how about some circles? They look nice. Some ellipses. It's pretty wild stuff. The consumer verdict isn't in yet, but already Mac is stirring controversy. Computer users seem to either love it or hate it. I haven't found anyone who doesn't have an opinion. Here are a few of them. One common complaint is the screen. It's black and white and only nine inches measured diagonally. That's pretty small, perhaps too small for some people. But I don't miss the color. Mac's video display is so sharp and clear, it looks more like a printed page than a computer screen. This keyboard appears small as well, but the keys are full size, have a good feel, and are spaced correctly and easy to type on. Some have complained that these storage disks aren't standard size. But these little data disks are deceptive. Each one holds 400,000 bytes of memory, more than most conventional floppies. The Macintosh could use more memory, but then no one ever seems to be satisfied with the amount of memory in their computer. But the real reason why this computer is dividing users is because it changes the basic definition of what a computer is and isn't. Make no mistake, this is a major departure from every other machine we've seen, except for the Xerox Star, which introduced this kind of technology, and Apple's Lisa. If you're seriously interested in shopping for a Macintosh, here are a few things to remember. Discount prices will be tough to find initially, and at $2,500, it is reasonably expensive. But if you're a student or connected to a college or university, you may qualify for a discount. 
Two nice programs come with Macintosh, Mac Paint, and Mac Write. But some limitations come with them. In about six months, more extended word processing and other programs will be available. You'll also have to wait if you want to program Mac. No programming languages come with the machine, and they won't appear for another couple of months. At present, you're also locked into Apple's peripherals, a second disk drive at about $400, and a printer for $500. The dot matrix printer is a serious limitation, but almost a necessity since Mac is so visually oriented. So, for now, you can't use the letter quality printer. I hope this changes soon. There are plenty of people who haven't been turned on by computers yet. To them, a computer is nothing more than a glorified typewriter or filing cabinet. And let's be fair, most computers are just that. But if this one doesn't stand them on their ear and make believers out of them, then nothing will. I think the Mac is pretty, brilliant, and elegant. A real milestone. You could do a lot worse than to bet on the Mac. Tim was one of many reviewers of this interesting computer. I devoted one of my nationally syndicated columns to it. It seemed to me there were a lot of reasons not to buy it, but even more reasons why you should go to a store and play with it. Incidentally, those columns are now available to those of you with home computer terminals through the New Tech Times online service. And what do we have for you next week? Stories like these. In the next edition of the New Tech Times, creating art with light, laser technology provides a new medium for high-tech artists. Also, the debate at Ohio State over computer literacy as manufacturers try to break into the collegiate market. This and more in the next edition of the New Tech Times. So join me then, won't you? For the New Tech Times staff, I'm Nicholas Johnson. Times has been brought to you through a grant from Wausau Insurance Company. Times change. Wausau works. And by the collective voice of the consumer electronics industry, the CEG, the Consumer Electronics Group, Electronic Industries Association. For a transcript of this program, send $3 to program number 122, the New Tech Times, 821 University Avenue, Madison, Wisconsin, 53706. Or you can now communicate electronically with the New Tech Times. Just call the source or CompuServe and select the New Tech Times online. Next time on Austin City Limits, a special salute to some of the living legends of country music. Swinging doors, reach out for me and draw me in. They know each night that I'll be back to wind me up again. Very true, and its content's good for you. The song the Bible will doom your poor soul. Friday night at 9. Next time on Living Wild, Antarctic Summer, narrated by Barnard Hughes. When these majestic mountains of ice begin to thaw, penguins head out in search of a mate. Sea lions, too, are finding their way back to breeding grounds where they themselves were born. Antarctic Summer, next time on Living Wild. Join us Sunday night at 8. Masterpiece Theatre presents Drake's Venture, the dramatized history of Elizabethan England's most daring and controversial adventurer and his treacherous voyage around the world. You are hauling these men to their graves. 
You are taking them to regions in which even Magellan failed to return. Sir Francis Drake's venture, a two-hour special on Masterpiece Theatre. Watch Sunday at 9. Watch the Academy on Computers, Bits and Bytes, premiering Tuesday, April 17th, here on Iowa oh. Public Television. And this is 2020. On the ABC News Magazine, 2020. Tonight, the Columbus, Ohio community is outraged by the release of this man. Women of Ohio, be warned that there is a known rapist free on the streets that has been released. Billy Milligan was acquitted because the court believed he had multiple personalities. What happened? Adelina, she, she committed the rapes. Sylvia Chase with some critical questions in a case of multiple personality. Saigon, April 1975. Operation Babylift. The rescue of Vietnamese orphans. But the plane, full of babies, crash landed. It was just as crashing, bumping, and it was endless. For the survivors, anguish, possible brain damage, and years in the courts. It is a travesty that this case has not been resolved even as of this date. Tonight, Tom Gerald with the aftermath of Operation Babylift. What happened to the children? Have you ever had a phone call like this? Guess what? Your business has been selected by our computer to win one of three fabulous prizes. Consumer correspondent John Stossel goes to the source of the calls, follows some people who responded, and looks at the prizes to see if what was advertised was too good to be true. Up front tonight, crime and our perception of justice. Sylvia Chase is here with a fascinating story right on that subject. You know, strange events keep testing our faith in the justice system of this country. Convicts on parole commit murder. Felons are on the streets after short sentences. And increasingly, we are baffled and enraged by this sort of thing. The people near Columbus, Ohio, are facing this dilemma now. There's a man there who raped three women and offered a bizarre defense, which was successful. Sylvia, tell us about it. That man was found not guilty by reason of insanity because he had multiple personalities. You remember a few months ago, Hugh, I did a story about multiple personalities. Yes. There are people who have many personalities within one body, and when one personality is in control of the body, the other personalities don't know what's going on there, asleep. So it seems. Well, Billy Milligan was found not guilty by reason of insanity. He did...